In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Did you ever notice how it seems that corrupt modern society always tries to promote some sensation or some controversy to distract Christians from the thought of Holy Week? Some examples from uh, the past... An anti-Catholic soft porn miniseries called The Thorn Birds, uh, one year was promoted during Holy Week. Uh, on another occasion in Cincinnati, the filthy photos of the Maplethorpe uh, exhibit were promoted. There's a big controversy over that. The Elian Gonzalez case in Florida, uh, the young Cuban boy who came to the United States and he was seized by uh, federal government uh, officials to be sent back to Cuba on Good Friday. Of course, last year, the Terry Schiavo case, causing much comment in the media. Uh, and again, in our own Cincinnati, several years ago, five years ago, I think, uh, all the play in the press uh, given to a shooting that eventually ended up provoking riots during Holy Week. All of these attacks coming as they do around the sacred time of Holy Week should only put the truth for us into the foreground and assure us of the ultimate victory of our faith. This past year's attack came in the publicity given to a document called the Gospel of Judas. What's all this about? I think we first have to look at who benefits and who promoted this particular controversy to distract our attention from the real meaning of Holy Week. First of all, National Geographic magazine benefited. It was a circulation booster for them, this talk about the Gospel of Judas. There's a TV special given much play in the talk shows, popular culture, the media. Most people in our age, remember, are idiots who don't read, they don't think, they don't reason, and they are addicted to the passive sensation uh, that comes their way through television. And television seeks the lowest common denominator to get people's attention. The way they do this is hyping a controversy with some sort of big supposed revelation and so that's what we got this year, uh, this uh, uh, great hype, this great story. Judas was the misunderstood man of history, and Christianity had had it wrong for centuries. And now, a word from our sponsors. So, National Geographic benefited. Then, it, uh, secondly, it was a great money maker for uh, the owner the woman who owned this document, a woman with the euphonious Irish Catholic name of Mrs. Nussbaum. Now, she had kept this document in a bank vault in Long Island for a while, hoping to uh, flog it to someone to uh, profit from it. And she was quoted in the New York Times as saying that she always believed that, quote, Judas had selected her for a special mission. Wonderful. Wonderful. So uh, she was able to flog this document to National Geographic, and so she stands to gain one to two million dollars from it, which is a tidy improvement on 30 pieces of silver. So there's the owner, and then there are the different new agey types that society is crawling with, uh, the uh, new age being an outgrowth of uh, the hippie culture of the wonderful 1960s. People who believe in the power of crystals and magic pyramids and enagrams and connecting you with the cosmos. You hear them talk about spirituality. But what they really mean is a uh, substitute for religion. Their notion of spirituality is not centered on God and on his truths, but is centered on little old me. Whatever uh, I want, there are no objective standards, of course. Whatever makes me feel good, gives me warm and fuzzy feelings, whatever helps me realize my potential, this is 
what they consider to be spirituality. So this so-called Gospel of Judas is uh, another little uh, piece in uh, the, the, this little puzzle for them, another part of uh, their self-centered spirituality. Thirdly, or fourthly rather, you get the professional feminists and anti-Catholic academics. Uh, they appeared on various talk shows to chatter on about this. Uh, most famous of them is a woman named Elaine Pagels, P-A-G-E-L-S. About uh, ten years ago, she produced something called the Gnostic Gospels, uh, which uh, was uh, an account of uh, certain uh, early writings writings from the early centuries, supposedly about the Christianity. Uh, in effect, this was an, an attack against the truth of Scripture based on the false criteria of modern scholarship, which, of course, is changing all the time. And she and others like her attempted to raise ancient documents that were rejected by the witness of the church as false and heretical as to raise them to the level of alternative narratives about the origins of Christianity, which had supposedly been suppressed by the church. You still see people reading her writings. You'll see that, uh, I'll see that sometimes when I'm traveling, people in the, the, uh, this nonsense is sold in airports, airport bookshops. Then, fifthly, the controversy benefited modernist theologians who are nominally Catholic. Now, remember, part of the modernist heresy is the truth is not something fixed, an objective or revealed by God. It comes from within, and it gradually evolves. So there's one truth for one age and another truth for another age, and uh, everything is, is uh, constantly changing. You can't get uh, at any notion of objective truth. So you get a comment from the head of the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome, Father Pisano, who says that, well, early believers didn't really know yet what to believe. And this Gospel of Judas is a reflection of that. And this was one dead end for doctrine. We are still learning. We're still learning, etc. And then uh, Monsignor Brandmuller, the head of the Vatican Committee for Historical Science, says that, well, Judas may not have been deliberately evil, not deliberately evil, and of course the implication here is that no one is really responsible for anything or for his own actions. It's always society. Um, it, it's, it's always something out there, something out there that, that uh, is responsible. So uh, you get the National Geographic, you get the owner, the new AG types, professional feminists, anti-Catholic academics, nominally Catholic modernists, and then finally, of course, the Jews who control the media. Now, the, there's an Egyptologist from the University of Chicago uh, commenting on this particular uh, document. And he said that, well, through the rehabilitation of Judas with this gospel by presenting him as the closest disciple of Christ and the one Christ chose to betray in order to fulfill God's will, well, this text reduces one of the favorite themes of anti-Semitism to nothing. So, those are the different groups who benefit what is this document? What's it about? Well, the document itself is a 3,000-word text, a 4th to 5th century manuscript. It was found in a cave in the Middle East. It was written in Coptic, the Egyptian language. It was not written by Judas, of course. It may be a copy of a document uh, with a similar name that is earlier mentioned in the history of Christianity. St. Irenaeus, the great doctor of the church, St. Irenaeus of Lyon in 180 AD, uh, wrote uh, a treatise called Against the Heresies. And he mentions in it a bogus document named, uh, that's referred to as the Gospel of Judas. Uh, in this document, Judas emerges as a hero. Uh, 
And it portrays our Lord as saying, well, Judas will be greater than all of those who are baptized because he will sacrifice the man that clothes me. The man that clothes me. Now, what does this refer to? This is actually an allusion to the heresy of Gnosticism and dualism. The idea that all matter is evil and created by an evil god and created by the devil and and created by the god of the Old Testament. And uh, opposed to this is another god, a good god, who is the god of the spirit and the god of the New Testament. And these two gods are constantly at war. This is a very uh, ancient, uh, very, very uh, ancient and very diabolical teaching. So it, uh, uh, that uh, crops up time and time again in the, uh, in history. And you see it in, in the Christian era in Gnosticism. You see it in the, the Albigensians and the Cathars in the uh, Middle Ages and so on. This idea that matter is evil and the consequence of that is that, well, uh, uh, it makes absolutely no difference what you do in the material world because all matter is evil anyway. And so uh, as far as sins of the flesh, you can do whatever you want. Very, very convenient. Very convenient. So the Gnostics were part of this, this uh, uh, dualist movement. And they're called Gnostics from the Greek word uh, gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, which uh, refers to a knowledge. And in the case of the Gnostics, it meant a secret knowledge that was passed on uh, occultly in a hidden fashion uh, from uh, our Lord to a secret elect group. And the Gnostics believed in syncretism. Syncretism, taking elements from different religions and putting them together. Obviously, there's a great deal of appeal for that with the New Age people and with modern ecumenists, people who see no difference between one religion, basically, and another. So that's the document itself. It's part of a uh, a group of, of documents called the Apocrypha. Apocrypha. Now, there are ancient texts that were circulated in early Christian times that um, claim to be written by various personages in the time of our blessed Lord. Uh, There's one document called the Acts of Pontius Pilate, uh, another one called the Acts of Caiaphas, or the Gospel of St. Thomas, etc., uh, there's a, a large group of, of these documents. It's about a thousand pages worth in a big fat book. But these documents were rejected by the church, rejected by the church as false. Well, the church has always known about the existence of these documents because she passed judgment on them and said that uh, they are false and that they are erroneous and are not to be believed by Catholics. I remember hearing about this when I was in eighth grade in Catholic school. And I was fascinated that uh, there's some stuff like this out there. So um, I got on the bus and I went down to the Milwaukee Public Library and uh, I uh, checked out a copy of uh, this the collection of uh, the Apocrypha, of uh, the Acts of Pilate and Caiaphas and St. Tom the Gospel of St. Thomas and so on. And I found it fascinating, but even as a, a kid with a uh, just an education of grade school catechism, I could tell that this was totally bogus. All of this stuff was completely bogus. The reason why it is bogus and worthless is this, that the... Things like the Gospel of Judas uh, are based, uh, uh, they're given credence based on a hidden principle. It's extremely important as Catholics to understand uh, the principles and especially the criteria for determining what is true and determining what is false. 
And the hidden principle is this, is the, essentially that of, of Protestantism and modernism. And this is what's operating in the so-called Gospel of Judas controversy. That private interpretation of some written document trumps the witness of the church. Private interpretation of texts. Now, Christ did not found a religion like that, a religion where you engaged in a private interpretation of written texts, where you determined for yourself what was true and what was false, what God wanted you to believe and what he didn't want you to believe based on some text that you were handed. And uh, our Lord certainly didn't found a religion of hidden knowledge, uh, passed along in a secret fashion from generation to generation. If you accept the Protestant criteria uh, on private interpretation, private judgment, of course you can accept something like the Gospel of Judas. It's just one more uh, religious uh, text for you to work with, and you, you judge it entirely on your own. It's very interesting um, to be asked over the past couple of weeks by Protestants, well, what do you think about this Gospel of Judas? And uh, I always respond with something like this, that it, it's a, uh, it gets back to the, uh, uh, the old problem of private interpretation, that uh, uh, Christ founded a church to tell you what's right and to tell you what's wrong, and that church is the Catholic Church. And uh, that is the one true church. That's the church that, that's found in the Bible. And uh, to go back far enough in history is to become a Catholic and uh, is to learn that it is not your private judgment, but it is the judgment of uh, the church and the authority of the uh, Catholic Church that is the criterion. What about what is in, in Scripture, the list of books that we know as inspired. In the early centuries of the church, you got what you needed to know to get to heaven from the preaching of the Catholic Church, the preaching of priests and bishops, acting and teaching with authority. So the idea of uh, a book that uh, you call uh, the Bible that was put together with a clear-cut list did not exist from the beginning in the church. The important thing was tradition, was the oral teaching, oral teaching. And what we call the, uh, is the canon of Scripture was uh, formed uh, in the second century between 100 and, and 200 A.D. Then there was a discussion of these uh, different documents among the fathers of the church from about 200 to the year 367. And then the church, by her authority, finally fixed the canon of Scripture uh, between 376 and 405 A.D. Popes, the councils of the church, bishops of the church, fixed the canon of Scripture. And the church rejected many d documents that, uh, as not inspired, as false, as heretical, as not in conformity with the living witness of the church. So the reason why something like the Gospel of Judas is, is, is bogus is because of this, that the, the church had rejected it. That is the criterion. The texts for the Mass today speak about faith, the Epistle and the Gospel. Faith is not simply some sort of an emotional conversion experience, but faith in the Catholic sense is a supernatural virtue. We believe matters revealed by God as true because of the authority of God revealing. Faith comes to us through the church which possesses authority and is a witness to the truth established by Christ. Our religion is not one based on a pile of documents that we have to sort through to figure out for ourselves. 
aided by publicity departments, money-hungry people, uh, New Agers, godless feminist academics, modernist clergy, and the Jewish-controlled media that's intent on distracting us. We know what the church accepts and what she rejects. She lays down the criteria for separating the true from the false. And thus our faith is the victory that will overcome the world. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.